Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention. The forum is about to begin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this forum discussion. Before we proceed, let me introduce myself. My name is Candida Fortuna Anak Budit, and I will be hosting this forum for today. First of all, I would like to give some brief introduction on Hall of Aspire. Hall of Aspire is organized by Altruistic Malaysia. Hall of Aspire are essential in process giving all people access to knowledge and information. This platform needed more than ever in digital days. Most importantly, Hall of Aspire are the places where you can find critical topics or causes that need to be discussed nowadays. The topic is varies by the action that need to be taken. For example, for peace, education, environment, health, humanitarian, and economy. So for today, ladies and gentlemen, we will discuss title The Flows of Challenges and Achievements, Malaysia-Japan Education System. This forum is an online platform under Health and Education Center Altruistic Malaysia that aims to help community in Malaysia to properly understand system, issue, challenges, expected result, and achievement of current system, especially in terms of comparing with Japan education system, which is by conducting a discussion to explain more about the reality of education. The goals for this session are to promote and carry out discussion in the reality aside debate that hit up this issue. To ensure that Malaysia educa education system consider important things such as the need, potential, quality, preparedness, and sustainability when initiating education hubs. Whole of Aspire with a professional and experienced panelist is set to discuss flows of challenges and achievements. So for our topics today, we will be having three gentlemen. Our first panel is Professor Emeritus Tansri Dato Zulkifli Abdul Raza. He, he is currently director of the International Islamic University Malaysia. Tansri Dato was awarded the prestigious 2017 Gilbert Medal by Universitas 21 in recognition of his long-term commitment to a sustainable approach to international higher education. He is also a fellow of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, the World Academy of Art and Science, and the World Academy of Islamic Management. In February 2021, he was invited to serve as an expert for the futures of higher education projects in Caracas. In addition, the government of Japan in recognition of his contribution to the academic collaboration and exchanges between the two nations has conferred him the order of the rising sun gold race with neck ribbon in september 2019. we welcome our first panel professor emeritus tansri dr zukifli abdul raza so our next panelist is mr saito yukiyoshi he was originally the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports Science, and Technology. He was the director at the Division of International Relations for Hokkaido University for four years. Mr. Saito was also the deputy director at the Division of Media, Information, and Foreign Language Education for three years. And now, he is the first secretary, Embassy of Japan in Malaysia. We welcome our panelist, Mr. Saito Yukiyoshi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next gentleman is Mr. Ahmad Bustaman Yusuf. He holds a bachelor degree of education in University of Toyama. He has working as a coordinator in Machispo Toyama, and he has also worked as an interpreter in Toyama General Manufacturing Industry Trade Fair. In 2018, he was the president of Toyama University International Student Supporter until 21. 
And in February 2019, he was the vice president of Toyama Malaysia Student Association until February 2020. So we welcome our panel, which is Mr. Ahmad Bustaman Yusuf. Hi, Assalamualaikum, Kumbangwa, Konnichiwa, Rajahau, Banikum, everybody. <laughs> All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, panelists, maybe we can start our session for today. Yes. All right. For the first question, I would like to ask the first question to Tan Sri Dato. Okay, Tan Sri Dato, as we all know, Japan is one of the top education hubs which is known all over the world. From the research that I have made on the internet, Japan is listed as top 10 in the education rankings by country in 2021, which they are in the seventh place based on World Population Review. Malaysia somehow is also improved in their education system. I take for example, one of the top list university is University of Malaya, where it remains the nation's best in its overall position and third among the Asian universities. So based on that, what is your opinion on Malaysia's education system itself and the advantage of it? And the, the... Okay, let, let me thank you for, for inviting me. I think this is a very good forum, a very relevant forum to discuss, particularly after the COVID uh, uh, infection in many of the countries. I think our perspective on education also has changed as compared to what it used to be. I would like to make, first of all, Candida, the comment on ranking. I am... In particular, are not very... Now, that is not to say that Japan is not the best university, but to call to qualify Japan as part of the ranking system, I think, is not very fair, depending on the kind of ranking system that you use. Yeah? Uh, most of the ranking system, at least in Malaysia, they are very commercial-driven. And they are also very based uh, based in English countries, UK, uh, US, and therefore non-English countries do not get the same coverage. Japan is in a good example. Uh, when you look at research, for example, uh, Japan there does a lot more research in Japanese languages, published in Japanese languages, and therefore they don't get into you know to be accountable as far as research is concerned. Uh, and therefore uh, there are some biases in the context of uh, recognizing university just based on riches. That's, that's my, my opinion. And, but that's not to say that Japan is not a good university or a good country as far as education is concerned. Now, if I were to look at Japan, my relationship with Japan goes back when I was in USM, maybe the year before this, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, we forged a relationship with Japan and probably you know also my father was a Hibu, Hibakusha in, in Japan in 1945. And therefore, I, I know Japan quite a bit as far as education is concerned. And that is why I think in USM, we forged a relationship between Japan and Malaysia so that there is an exchange between the two countries and learning from Japan how the education system is constructed. Now, Japan is very much uh, an industrialized country. And therefore, they are very up as far as research is concerned in the, in, the, in the context of technology, right? And their friend is very advanced in that particular area. And that's why when the Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister, uh, Tun Mahathir or Datuk Mahathir then uh, started the Look East policy, it was for the purpose of learning from Japan how do they construct not only the education system, but all the other systems to the Japan that Malaysia ought to learn. Before that, we, we look west, as it were, uh, to US, to UK, as a kind of a model. But uh, Tun Mahade changed the perception because there's a lot of things that we can also learn uh, from Japan. And therefore, this recognition alone, I think, will give us comfort that we can uh, learn, I think, uh, not only the technology, but also the culture. Japanese culture is still very much intact. It's although they are very advanced uh, technologically and also the way they sort of uh, uh, manage uh, their lifestyle 
manage their organization and the whole question of their society is very well managed as far as as far as uh, the country goes yeah uh, often people talked about uh, Japan in a very positive light as far as that is concerned so I think that there is this idea of working together for Malaysia and Japan to learn from one another. I know Japan are also very excited about Malaysia in the context of multiculturalism. Uh, Japan, as you know, are very homogeneous, mainly Japanese, not much foreign, not foreigners until probably very lately. And these are the two values that I think that we can learn uh, from one another. And all of this, to me, is part of education. When I talk about the education, I do not talk about just the university. University is one part of education, but outside the university, there's so many other dimensions of education that we need to learn informally or non-formally that makes us a better person at the end of the day. And I think this is what Japan has succeeded in doing. And I think we need to learn a lot more from Japan in that particular context. How do you actually not only organize education, but also our community, our society, and also uh, moving forward as quote-unquote a developed or in an in industrialized country. Thank you. All right, thank you for your insights, Tan Sri Dato. Yeah. And then we move on to our next question. Okay, this next question is, I would like Mr. Saito to give his thought on this matter. So the question goes, how can the partnership of the education system between these two countries mm -hmm. enable bilateral relations to be stronger? Thank you very much. Uh, Namasaya Yukio Saito. Dari Kudute Ambasa Japan di Malaysia. So thank you very much for welcoming. Uh, me today in the uh, great event. So, and I'm also honored to be with Tansuri and Mr. Ahmad uh, Bustamansam. And uh, I'd like to answer the question the, what is unique about the relations between Japan and Malaysia is the presence of the long running and strong bond of friendship between the two countries. <clears throat> and the mutual trust has been cultivated through educational and close business interactions and, and uh, the Look East policy, which was launched in 1982 and will mark its 40th anniversary next year. So in terms of the educational exchanges, we Japanese government provides scholarship every year for international So, so far, more than 1,800 Malaysian students study in Japan by this next scholarship. So, in addition, the unique policy here is, of course, dispatching Malaysian students look the Malaysian government. So uh, more than 8,500 <clears throat> Malaysian students study in Japan. And this year, just last month, and in the beginning of this month, more than 200 Malaysian students arrived at Japan and started their study life in Japan. It comes to the educational cooperation. I'd like to mention MJIIT, Malaysia Japan International Institute of Technology, which was established in 2011. So here, Japan provides yen loan and cooperation through Japanese University Consortium, and also dispatching Japanese academic staff. And now MJIIT, intensively introduces during education Asia. So seizing the opportunity for 40th Lucrist policy anniversary, you'd like to make deeper collaboration between Japan and Malaysia. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Saito, on your talk. So we will be moving on to the next question. All right, Mr. Busawan, I want to ask, what are the differences in study experience in Malaysia and Japan? Uh, well, this is a very interesting question, actually, because <laughs> there's a huge, uh, not there's a huge difference between the experience, the study experience in Malaysia and Japan. But I think first and foremost is, the, of course, the class itself that I have to bear all the subject was being teach in Japanese. I mean, the mother tongue, which is in Japanese. So even the textbook was in English, it's still being taught in Japanese. And, but of course, in our country, I believe that most of the universities are using English as the main uh, and the communication language between the professor and also the student itself. And so that's that I, had, I have to take time to really understand the class. Uh, but I'm very lucky that I'm surrounded by many friends to help me. Sometimes, like even the Japanese student itself, they themselves cannot read the kanji, the handwriting of the professor. So we have to discuss the kanji, what is written on the blackboard, and so on. It's a very interesting experience for me. Next is uh, uh, the fall season itself, that I have to adapt with a sudden change in the temperature, especially during the winter and also the summer. Looking and um, playing snow was also fun, but the laundry and what you want, but you have to think what the clothes that can keep you warm for the whole day. So it's very difficult for me to, but uh, enjoying the scenery every season will always stay as the best memory ever in my life. Even it just like a short four years experience because I. I have a lot of international friends from, from Japan, of course, from Vietnam, from Thai, from Laos, and etc. Next is, um, I think, the, the prayer time. Uh, because in Malaysia, we, we have the surau, the musola itself, to, for the student to pray and so on. But in Japan, we don't have that kind of facility for, for the student. Uh, but somehow, like, now they are creating more facility for the Muslim. So... In Japan, it's not a common thing for them to pray like us five times a day. So the only thing that I know when the Japanese is going to pray is during the Hatsumo day, maybe. Right, Master, Master, Mr. Saito. Hatsumo day is like when they went to the shrine to pray during the New Year. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the time that I know that when is Japanese going to pray. So uh, to pray that you have to find your own place to pray. And sometimes you have to find a small corner where you don't want to make the Japanese to become surprised what you're doing right now in the, in the middle of the place and thing, right? So then you also have to manage your time wisely as the class will start like 8.45 a.m. in the morning and also will end like sometime is 6 p.m. in the evening. So especially during the winter, you have three prayers that you have to do. So Zoho, Asa and Maghrib. So you have to skip the class yes. just to take a toilet break to pray something. So I think that's the the, the, the study experience, the, the different in the study experience in Malaysia and Japan that I experienced during my four years uh, in Toyama, Japan. All right, thank you, Mr. Bustaman, on your answer. Uh, may I know um, how many months does it take for you to be fluent in Japanese language? uh it's i actually i studied at pusat bahasa tokyo in kuala lumpur for 21 months until i can reach level jlpt n1 so it's quite like a very short time but i have to compare everything I've, i mean 2000 kanji plus plus something i have to remember uh, it's quite like a tough time for me <laughs> might be it must be quite tough but then it's something interesting to learn something new right yeah. yes 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 to know the culture of japan you have to learn the language mm. then you can understand it yes okay thank you mr bustaman on your answer so we'll be mo moving forward to the next question uh tan sri yes as director at international islamic university malaysia does or does not Japan have an education system adapted in IIUM, specifically in Malaysia generally? And if so, how was it done? Okay, let me start off with, with a very broad uh, perspective that I got. 
I think Japan, we, when I look at it, I think it's, it's about nation building. Yeah? This is what I learned from my father. When the atomic bomb was dropped in 1945, August 6, yeah? uh, my father did mention to me, one Japanese uh, told him then that within 20 years, he says the Japanese will rise up again. So you can see by by 1945, by nine, by early or by early 1970s, you already see Japanese become a very uh, industrialized economic country uh, within the 20 years of of J Japanese uh, sort of experience after the war. Now this is something which Malaysia attempted to do when you talk about wawasan 2020. Yeah, uh, Tun Mahathir started as Wawasan in 1991, I think, and we were supposed to end it in the year 2020, a 30 year period. Now, I think the aspiration is the same. We want Malaysia to be a developed country, and during that period, also, as mentioned, we go to Japan and learn what the Japanese. Is did uh, so that we can also be in that. But you can see the Malaysian experience is not as successful as the Japanese experience. Now uh, it becomes uh, an issue uh, why it is not as successful. Uh, this, I think, is a question that we need to now ask whether it is part of education, whether it is part of socialization, or whether it is part of culture uh, that we need to, to, to see. And this is what I think we need to focus on now. So when we move forward, as far as IIUM is concerned, we look at Japan as a country that is very disciplined in its undertaking, you know, in its implementation and also in its ideas of trying to, to make Japan a better country. For example, now Malaysia talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0. Most countries uh, talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0 but Japan does not talk about Industrial Revolution 4.0. Japan talks about Society 5.0. And there's a big difference between 4.0 and Society 5.0. And the big difference from my point of view is Japan, when they talk Society 5.0, they're talking about a better human being, even the technology around that. It is not a technology focus. It is a human focus. It is a human-centric activity rather than a technology-centric activity. But here, when you talk about 4IR, it is very much a technology-centric activities. Sometimes I wonder, where is the human being in the 4IR? And this is a question that I will always raise, you know. We've got all this robotics. We've got this automation. We've got this industrialization. Where is the human being? Will the human being be a better human being? Or will the human being suffer on the consequence of technology? I think everybody knows yeah, about technology taking the place of human in terms of employment and so on and so forth. Those are the issues that I think we have not discussed. But those are the issues that the Japanese are very clear about. When they talk about 5.0, it's about upgrading human quality of life, particularly the, the older generation. Yeah? And how do we use technology as a supplement to human life as it were? Uh, I think these are the things that we are aware of, that Japanese has got a different mindset, different way of thinking, different way of analyzing, in fact, even the future. And Malaysia needs to come to terms with that. Malaysia cannot be just talking about this as though it is, you know, something that do not affect us. We, particularly IIM, being a Muslim university, the first thing that we are concerned about is a human being. The technology is important, but the human being is more important than the technology. And the technology becomes a supplement to the, 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 the human life, not a substitute to human life. And IIUM, therefore, is looking at this very closely. We have felt, for example, interested, how do Japanese become a very disciplined society? And we begin to learn that they do this when they were still young. At the age of three, at the age of four, when they were sent to the kindergarten, you know, they were told about certain values, a certain way of doing things, certain discipline. And you imagine when you start at the age of three, by the time you become teenager, all this perhaps is part of your culture, part of your life. For us, when we go to Tadika, we don't emphasize that on so much. We're more interested in how to read, how to write, you know, how to uh, become... Uh, uh, number one in class with so many A's. And we are very, very 
narrow in our looking and therefore the discipline are not very well taken after. So these are issues that I think that the university is interested in. I think not only the university, the whole nation is interested in. So our Tadika, for example, now we are trying to adapt some of the uh, practices, some of the methodology that uh, the, the, the Japanese are using in their Tadika so that we can also begin early rather than you know begin very late uh, the way it is. Again, for example, in terms of culture, we are interested in culture also, not just tech science and technology, which is important, but the culture at the same time, because the culture supports, like Bustamam say, the, sub, the, the culture supports the spiritual, uh, not spiritual perhaps, the social sort of cohesiveness among the Japanese. You know, the, how they work together, how they collaborate together, uh, rather than, you know, fighting each other and competing with one another that do not bring benefit to the nation as a whole. So that is a perspective you are talking, uh, inshallah. And I think this collaboration between Japan and, and Malaysia, and particularly my university, is going on in, in various directions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tansri, on your answer. It is such an eye-opening for our audience. To, and as what I know is, Japanese are so disciplined in their life, yeah. For example, what I know is that they will bring books whenever they go, like when they are in the train, they will read books. And maybe, um, um, am I correct, uh, Mr. Ahmad Bustaman? Um, <laughs> uh, for, for the upper generation, I think yeah, they're still reading the newspaper, they're still reading books. Uh, in the trains, but I think the younger generation now they are only just using the smartphones. I think just <laughs> let the Malaysian right now. <laughs> uh, okay, I see. All right, yeah. thank you. Okay, for the next um, question is for Mr. Saito. So, the role of the Japanese embassy is to ensure the promotion of the Japanese education system mm -hmm. even greater in Malaysia. So, how does Japan Embassy doing their promotion for education in Japan to Malaysia? And what measure did they use to promote education in Japan to Malaysia? And does that way uh, relevant to reaching out to the local community? Okay, thank you very much for your question. So, the most important thing is human-to-human uh, -human relations between Japan and Malaysia. So by promoting educational exchanges, students will give a great impact on each education. So some students have pursued their careers in the academic or educational institutions, uplifting research and nurturing the next generation of promising young Malaysians. So I'd like to I've mentioned that uh, Tansuri mentioned a very important point before about the multiculturalism in Malaysia. So when young Japanese community, when ja young Japanese communicate with Malaysian students, like, uh, like you know, uh, Mr. Ahmad Bustamansan were students in Japan, right? So they can learn Japanese. Young Japanese can learn about Malaysia's beautiful, unique, and diverse culture. So we are now in a globalized world, and we'd like to learn from the uniqueness of the other countries and their people. So especially Malaysia is a great model for Japan to learn multiculturalism, as Tansri mentioned. So I think the human to human exchange is very important for both countries. Actually, some students are not aware of both government scholarships. So I hope students or young people who are watching this event as well will get information and apply for study in Japan. So we embassy would like to promote both scholarships in collaboration with Malaysian universities, alumni network, and even JPA. Uh, for not only, of course, not only for central areas, but wider areas all over the Malaysia, we would like to promote human to human exchanges. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, thank you for your insight, Mr. Saito. Okay, we will be moving on to the next question. Um, this question is for Mr. Bustaman. So what is the best thing based on your experience while you were studying in Japan that can be brought and adapted in Malaysia? Oh, thank you, Candida. So what is the best thing? I think it's the best thing, I mean, is the best thing that can be adapted in Malaysia, I think is the yeah. punctuality itself. I mean, the time management itself. Like for example, for every assignment or we call kadai in Japanese, that you have to be sent on time or you will be just fail. I mean, for gokaku something like. And if you were late for the class, even five minutes, some of the professors were very strict on the attendance. And even the buses train one way and move on time. So this thing is like, you don't have to worry when you want to you want to move anywhere. I mean, if you want to plan your journey, it's a very, very good one. Uh, I think, yeah, the time management culture can be implemented in our country. Maybe even it's still like a very difficult one. I think, you know, like the Malay culture itself, like uh, the, the procrastination or something, right? So uh, we can imagine that if a factory workers that that can really focus on work with no phone touching for unnecessary things the production of a product in one hour for example can be increased of course right like five product in just one hour then they can just focus on that things they they can increase the productions during that one hour period and of course if the buses and train in malaysia can move from time too people will be using more public transport and this does like can have a better environment and also can reduce the traffic jam even in the Kuala Lumpur itself like, very, uh, I mean the, the 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 hectic city life right so it will just cause stress and something in the, for the city people so it's also that when I came back in Malaysia for the first time after during the summer during my first year it's just like it become a culture shock for me even when i'm back in malaysia like why people don't become very punctual on time why i mean like we we want to be punctual because everybody like when people be punctual right nobody like people want to be procrastinate or be late or something right so i think this is this thing is actually the best thing can be adapted in malaysia and it also can help the to increase the economy of the country and also can help uh, for a better environment. For Malaysia too. It's a very famous one where we can see in the, the, in the anime something like uh, the Japanese will just clean their classroom by themselves. So this is, I think this is quite a, a little bit different. I think in Malaysia, we also clean our classroom, right? But the only difference, the classroom between Malaysia and Japan is that uh, the classroom in Japan is quite like indoor one. It's very like you have to put your shoes, your outside shoes uh, outside, and then you have to change for the indoor shoes and then you have to move into the classroom. So that's how they, they can clean the classroom, the, the, the floor of the classroom very well and something. And so this cleaning culture, I think, if we can actually adapt, if we can actually do for the Malaysians, uh, it can actually help to educate our people to keep our place clean for and then and then the environment also clean, not to throw rubbish away from car and etc. Right. So I think that the best thing that uh, I think that has been experienced in Japan for the, for the last four years. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bustaman. And I have extra uh, question here. Have you ever been late and left by the public transport? <laughs> uh, uh, it's like, uh, there's in Toyama, we got Shiden. It's like uh, a train that moves in the city. I think it's only in Fukui and Toyama got this kind of the, the train system. So <laughs> I didn't know where the timetable is like, yeah, during the weekday is a very different timetable, but for the public day or for the weekend is a very different time. So I have to meet my friend uh, 
at the station, but I almost got like one hour late because of the 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 train is like it's one hour and one hour only because it's like quite a rural area, so it's not so much public transport there. So yeah, that was I think only one time, only one time. It was <laughs> a very uh, good experience for me to be punctual on time. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Bustaman. All right, um, our next question is, I would like to ask Tansri. In Tansri's point of view, is the country's education system today better or in need of improvement? If needed, where is the most necessary part that need to be improved? Thank you. It's a difficult question. But education by nature has to improve all the time. But you don't, you don't, have, you don't have a choice. Because I think the world is advancing, technology is advancing, new knowledge has been discovered, you know. People are interacting with one another very closely. These are the factors that makes us to push education forward to improve all the time. Uh, not only within five years, but every year, I think there must be, there must be an improvement. Now, when we talk about COVID and post-COVID, there's a lot more that we need to improve. Because suddenly the COVID environment show many weaknesses in our education system and that we take for granted before because there was no need to talk about it because people are not dying. Now we see a lot of people dying just because of the weaknesses in the education system. A very clear one is, for example, when you talk about mental health, emotional health. Yeah, uh, At that one, at that I've been in university for almost 40 years, but nobody actually cares about this. Although we know there's a problem, but nobody cares about it because we think it's not an important problem. We are more interested in blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, all those physical health, because mental health does not manifest to be an issue. But now suddenly when we have a COVID environment, we find that mental health and emotional health becomes an issue when students are locked down when students are kept in their own environment and they do not have the capacity to cope. They cannot live alone, you know. They cannot manage themselves alone. And this is where coming back to, to, to some of the experiences that I know, uh, at least my, during my father's time, when the Japanese uh, learned to meditate. Okay, they, they are, I think during, I don't know whether your time, Adel Bustamam, but when I visited Japan, there are rooms for meditation still in some offices where people can go and meditate and get in touch with yourself and be refreshed you know emotionally and so on and so forth these are areas now that people are thinking again you know these are areas in education for example now i talk to people since this morning i talk to everybody and maybe i talk to 20 or 30 people today but when is the time that i talk to myself by 10 o'clock 12 o'clock, I will sleep. When is the time that I talk to myself? I can talk to Saito, I can talk to Bustamam, I can talk to Candida. I know who you are. Maybe we talk about our common problems. But I never talk to myself. I don't know my problem. And therefore, when I run into a problem, I don't know how to manage it because I've never get in touch with myself. This is where medication is important. This is where the prayers is important, that we begin to get in touch with ourselves. So this, these are the new things that we now, now need to tell our young students, especially the students who are very much, like Bustam Amsi, into the internet. Yeah, It's fine to be in, in internet, but that is also a problem that people feel that they're isolated. There's no human-to-human -human relationship. And that's why we keep on insisting the school must be open, the university must be open, so that we can meet other people other people, we can start talking to people, we can be quote-unquote human again, not just not just using technology and so on and so forth. So these are issues that I think we are beginning to address, even technology now. When you talk about technology, we always talk about technology as though it's a, it's a solution to our problem. But suddenly when COVID comes, we find that there is not enough internet. There's not enough connectivity. You know, our brothers and sisters in Sabah and Sarawak need to climb trees to get into inter internet connection. This is very, very embarrassing when Malaysia wants to be a developed country, but many of these facilities are not there. And these are issues that I think now we need to come to terms with. And it must be improved. 
you know and the improvement also in terms of culture that i talked to you about because now when we talk about covid it is it doesn't matter which race you come from which culture you come from which religion you come from we need to live together the moment one people do not live together then i think we find that COVID it becomes uh, and things i think now needs to be talked about to be improved and to make part and parcel of education not just education for examination not just education for work but education to live how do you live yeah with education rather than just how to earn a living earn a living is okay but how do you learn to live at the same time once you've got your your uh, your what do you call your your economics uh, uh, what do you call uh, level being achieved how do you live a life a good life as a human person moving forward this is basically for your generation because you got long a longer time to go my generation probably not as critical but how do you start improving i think is the issue that all of us are talking about no choice whether we like it or not we have to make that improvement otherwise we will not be able to survive the pandemic or many more pandemics that is coming in the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tan Sri Dato, on your answer. I do agree on your statement on saying that education needs to be improved. I can say here is that not only education, as we, as we can see, not only yeah. education needs to be improved, we ourselves also need to be, also need to improve ourselves to be yes. a better person. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you, Tan Sri. Pleasure. All right. Um, the next question is for Mr. Saito. As we all know, Japan is very popular on moral education. This is due to the desire to cultivate morality in students, which include mentality and attitude. Is personality development important in the development of society itself? And did the Japanese succeed through their system of enhancing the character development of the society in their own country? Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, it's very important for students to develop moral values such as respect for, you know, right. And it's very important. So that's why in Japan, uh, actually in the past, moral education was taught one, once a week as an extra curricular activity in primary and junior high schools. But in 2015, courses of study were partially revised. Moral education became a special subject. So currently, Japanese students uh, learn special moral education through special Moral education not only takes place in the moral class, but other classes for moral education. So for example, if students learn Japanese language, students also learn the development Hello, Mr. Saito. Excuse me, Mr. Saito. Your yes. line is not good. Yes. Your line is oh, really? unconnected. Yeah. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, now can yeah. Okay. So, if moral education, can you hear me? It's okay. Okay. So in Japan, moral education is very important. So moral education is provided not only in the special activity, but also other classes. So for example, if students learn Japanese language, students all learn the development of the ability to communicate in words with mutual respect. Students learn social studies. Students learn how to understand the history and life of a country or a region. 
if your students learn, you know, learn how to Excuse me, Mr. Saito. Uh, Yelan is not good. Uh, uh, not, not, not Bina. Yes. Okay. How about, how about now? It's okay? Uh, now okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, in my conclusion, uh, in Japan, moral education is very important. One side, but also in other subjects, students learn moral education. Thank you. All right, thank you for your insight, Mr. Saito. Um, now uh, we're moving to the next question, uh, Mr. Bustaman. Can you tell us about the co-curriculum that is provided by Japan and why it is more interesting than Malaysia? And also, what is your suggestions on the co-curriculum system when you're comparing the two education systems? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question, Candida. So, uh, I wasn't a teacher in Japan, but I have experience to go to some of the uh, Japan elementary school, Japan junior high school, Japan high school. And also, uh, I've been experiencing becoming uh, an English teacher for an English, uh, an English camp for a Japan, Japanese high school. So, and also I stay in an area where I got elementary school, junior high school and high school. So I, I can see uh, the environment that we can see in, in, the, in the anime itself. So in Japan, they have like this kind we call bukatsu, or uh, it's like a club activity, but, but a serious one where the student will practice after the school, even during the holiday to enter the competition, and etc. And a teacher or a coach will always be with them. So, but in our country, for some reasons that we cannot have that kind of disciplines, right? And for some students, maybe some parents didn't allow the students to join any sport and just this needed to focus on the study just like for especially for the spm students like right? <laughs> they're very they're very crucial uh uh what we call like to enter the university after that right so i believe that this kind of mindset of like playing sport is bad for the students should be put away from our thought actually like and students should be allowed to practice every day with a teacher or a coach uh, so this will not only make a healthy lifestyle for the students uh, themselves, but we can also have more athlete liners for our country sports teams, right? I think that's the most uh, now becoming a problem that we our sport teams, our national sport teams, doesn't have many uh, like the younger uh, generation to, to to join them, right? So, uh, and if we can make these things, uh, we can have like a healthy body and mind students too. And as we are aware that Malaysia is the top one country in the Southeast Asia with the obesity and the serious disease, disease right? So this one that like, we actually, we can help the students to become more healthy from the young uh, period so that when they become older, they will just stay healthy by themselves. So, and also like, I also stay in, a, in the, an area that have like a yaku, or is yaku in English? Uh, it's a baseball, baseball, <laughs> baseball stadium. So I can see when there's uh, baseball competitions where the parents, their uncle, the, the aunts, where, I mean, they will come and support with the o, o and we call in Japanese, uh, the student themselves. So which will always make me like feel very jealous like oh even the parents are supporting their the, the children doing sport and so on so this actually i think uh, we can try to to improve in the core curriculum uh in our country thank you all right thank you mr bustaman so do you play um baseball uh, no, I only play badminton with my friends in Japan. <laughs> okay, I see. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Bustaman. So, moving on to the next question for Tansri. 
are Malaysian students being moved more towards memorization and regulation or more towards solutions and critical thinking? May we have your thoughts on this matter? Sorry. Before I answer your question, let me comment a little bit about uh, what uh, Bustaman was saying. I think if you look at the uh, Ministry of Education, quote unquote, uh, in Japan, it is called MAX. Uh, MAX means it is science, technology, education, sports, and culture. You know, uh, for us, one ministry, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Culture mm -hmm. is somewhere else, Ministry of Sport is somewhere else. And then we split that into two. Ministry of Higher Education, which is another ministry. You got two ministries, whereas in Japan, one ministry look at science, technology, education, culture, sports. Five things under one. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they look at, at education in a very integrated way. You know, so when they want to organize, they organize it in an integrated way. All the things that the Bustamam is talking about is already in their, in their plan, as it were, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't miss. So we, when you talk about education, you also talk about sports, you also talk about literature, you talk about culture at the same time. And therefore, it is a very integrated way of looking at it. Whereas in Malaysia, when we talk about education, it's just education. It's about passing exams. Uh, the sports, somebody else will organize. A culture, somebody else will organize, you know. And our culture is about more about economics. It's more about uh, 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 tourism rather than the culture as part of education. Unlike Indonesia, Indonesia, the pendidikan dan kebudayaan the remains one. So these are issues that to me is not very good as far as education is concerned. Mm -hmm. We need to look at this again. We need to put it together in a way that, you know, the Japanese do or probably somebody else will do. But to leave two ministries with two def different ministers talking about different things sometimes, and not putting things together, I think is something that we, we are losing out at, at the end of the day. Yeah. So for coming back to your question, whether it's memorization or otherwise, I think it has to be both. It has to be both. I mean, we are not saying just memorize, but not, for, not talking about problem solving or thinking, but this needs to be both. Education in such a way that you cannot split it up. You cannot split things up. I think if you want to talk about knowledge, it has to be together. To start off with, I must remember something before I can solve a problem. I must remember, I must know something before I find I can find a solution. So, But the problem with us is that when we talk about memorization, we do not talk about how do you use this information to solve problem. How do you use information to make a better sort of a, a suggestion creativity or whatever if you we, we compartmentalize it because we are so exam oriented you know in exam orientation sometimes we don't ask questions of how to apply but almost only what you remember what you can recall but how do you use it is another important aspect that we are not good at and that's why we are talking about under the blueprint of Malaysia we are talking about uh, thinking a higher level, higher level of thinking, so that we can know, analyze, we can find solutions, we can take you know other issues at the same time as part of application of the knowledge that we got. But before we know that, we must we remember we must remember a few things so that this is part and parcel of the database that you need to have. And this is what I find also very problematic now with with children or new new student who are so used with these uh, handphones. Everything else is embedded in the handphones. During my time, I still can remember about 10 or 20, uh, 10 or 15 handphone, uh, what called tele telephone numbers. I can still memorize them. But now you ask Bustamam how many uh, telephone numbers or candidate, how many telephone numbers you can remember. I think <laughs> I'll be lucky if you can give me five. Because you also, <laughs> all of it is in the handphone. You lose the handphone, you're finished. You are no good anymore because you do not have this in your memory. And Jap Japanese is also good because they have to remember kanji. I mean, all this, you know, uh, Japanese uh, alphabets or thing. You have to memorize. Without memorizing it, you can never go. So it's a, a combination of the two. I think is more important than just one or the other as far as, uh, as, far as education is concerned. I hope I, hope I answer your question, Candida. 
Yes, thank you, Tansri, for your um, insight on this um, matter. All right, uh, moving on to the, our next question, which is for Mr. Saito. Um, I want to ask, what are the changes made in the Japanese education system over the years in order to improve the skills and ability of their students in learning new things? Thank you for your question. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. So, okay. Thank you. So due to the rapid development of technological innovation, as Tan Sri kindly explained, the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, which is next, has decided to make programming ICT education compulsory from 2020 in primary schools, from 2021, so this year, for in junior high schools. and from 2022, next year, uh, senior high schools. So we will introduce, we are now introducing the programming education. So this has been introduced because it's extremely important for children who will live in a society where they will be required to use computers in all their activities, no matter what their future career may be. But uh, the thing is that the programming education is not fostering students who can make programming very well, but for students who can make a logical thinking. So in order to foster students who can make a logical thinking, Japanese government introduces the programming education. And actually, this is not a special subject, but the teachers, the teachers uh, give a lesson uh, about the programming in each subject. So for example, in mathematics, students can learn how to draw, how to draw triangle or how to draw square with some commands. So this is some this is kind of logical in each subject teachers are focusing on programming still so in order to implement this programming education japanese government introduces giga school project so in this project children can get their own device, own PC or tablet device, and the schools can have a strong network so that they can use their own device even in school, not only at home. So this is the new But uh, in this regard, coming to Malaysia this March, I was very impressed with the Mice Jatila application because which is very, you know, digital and very technological skill, uh, device. And uh, indeed, uh, still in Japan, uh, there are some paper certificates for vaccination. So I also would like to know the Malaysian ICT, Information Communication Technology Education. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Saito, on your sharing. So now, uh, panelists, we will move forward to question and answer from the audience. Okay, I will check questions from the audience.